Uh, on today, I want to talk about in this session, uh, God will provide. God will provide. If there is nothing that we can think of, the best thing that we can ever think of, and not just have it as a thought, but we can have it as a a daily testimony, and that is that God will provide. Hello to those that are coming in. The reason why the topic is going to be called God Will Provide is because when you look at your life, you see all the stuff you've been through, you see the good, you see your bad, you know your ups, you know your downs, you don't weigh your pros and your cons. When you take inventory over everything, your inventory should come back that God provided. In the Old Testament, he provided meat for the children of Israel in the Old Testament. In Genesis, he provided a ram and the bushes that was caught. His horns was caught by the vessels of the bushes. He provided a ram for Abram because Abram was willing and obedient to sacrifice his son Isaac. I have a towel, paper towel, or something, a little warm. But he provided for Abram, not Abraham, because his name has not been changed to Abraham. His name became Abraham. After the blessings of the Lord. Thank you my love. Became Abraham after. Coming back from the slaughter of the kings. And Abraham gave a tenth. Of all his good things to. This high priest. The king of Salem. By the name of Melchizedek. I want to take you to. Many scriptures in the book. Many scriptures today. And the reason why I say many scriptures is because the whole Bible is a fulfillment of God providing. If those who have Facebook share this as a watch party on your Facebook page. Uh, that way others can view as well. Go to Facebook and share the video as a watch party. We want to try to get the message out. Let people know we don't just preach, but we teach. We have some teaching Bible principles. We have line upon line and precept upon precept type of teachings. God will provide. When you look at Moses, well, let me go back to Abraham first. But when you look at Abraham, and God tells him to offer up your son Isaac a sacrifice, and Moses, I mean, not Moses, God, I'm all in Moses today. But Abram is willing to offer him up as a sacrifice, then 
you got to understand that God already had knew that he was going to be willing and obedient to offer his son up to the father. Why would God require such a thing? We shout over the provision that God made for Abram. We shout over the fact that God told him, Hold, I have a ram in the bush. We shout over the fact that Abraham staggered not at the Eve God. And unto him it was counted unto him for righteousness. We shout over that part. We shout over the fact that it was God who called it those things which be not as though they are. But who would want to be Isaac? Who would want to be the one getting ready to lay down on the altar? But before you even get to the altar... You're carrying sticks on your back. And you ask your father. You say to your father, where is the sacrifice? This is what Isaac asked Abram. Father, where is the sacrifice? Abram looks at him and say, God will provide for himself a sacrifice. Now, so we're going to go there. Let's look at Genesis, not the member of the church. <laughs> Seventeen. In the 17th chapter, you see that, and when Abram was 90 years old and nine, the Lord appeared unto Abram and said to him, I am the almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. In other words, that word perfect is translated as be sincere. When you're sincere in your heart, God looks at you and says you're perfect. When you have no guile in your spirit, no envy in you, God say you're perfect. When you have love flowing through you, true love, love when you get hurt, you still love. Not the love that other folks call love and that's, I love those who love me. Because Jesus said, what good is that kind of love? Even the sinners can do that. You know. But he said, I am the almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. And I will make my covenant between me and thee. And will multiply thee exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face. And God talked with him. Saying. As for me. Behold my covenant is with thee. And thou shalt be a father of many nations. Now that sounds real good. When you hear God speak prophetically to you. And tell you that. I'm going to bless you. And your house. And your children's house. And your children's children's house. And for 30 generations will be blessed because of you. You remember Helen Baylor sung a song called I Had a Praying Grandmother. It was a testimony really, but she sung it that every time the devil tried to take her down this road and take her down that road, she would get on that roller coaster for a while, but she remembered she had a praying grandmother. Now just imagine, this is Helen Baylor talking about her praying grandmother. This is not Helen Baylor's mother 
talking about a praying mother. So God remembered the covenant with the grandmother because the grandmother instilled it in the mother and the mother and the grandmother instilled it into the daughter. And when the daughter go through some, she reflect back on if there was nobody I can really recall that was praying, I can remember my grandmother. So sometimes we as a people of God, we are actually living out the prophetic word that was spoken to our parents and grandparents and great grandparents from the voice of God. Although they might, some was brought into slavery and some was made to be enslaved, that wasn't a bad thing in their day and time. It was bad on some accounts, but look at how God showed himself to be so faithful and provided. You had some who were slaves working for their master, giving the Bible to interpret to the best of their knowledge, and yet the Holy Ghost taught them how to be submissive and obedient. And, and they didn't know about the Holy Ghost as much as we know. I cannot tell you my great grandmother about the Holy Ghost. I can't tell you that my great grandmother was a tongue speaking woman. She come up on the Southern Baptist where they preach hellfire and brimstones. My grandmother grew up in heavy tradition as well. Baptist tradition back then where they didn't believe in speaking in an unknown tongue. So I was give, given the gift of speaking in tongues through the Holy Spirit because I asked for it. So when you ask for something, God will provide. But be careful because when you ask for it, He not only provides, but here comes a challenge for what you're asking for. If you go and ask God to bless you, and I'm just throwing this out here. God, I need you to provide for me a husband. The first man that comes might not be the husband. You didn't say God provide a man. So you say, I need a husband. So God brought you a husband after Satan brought you a man. And watch this. If you're not careful, you'll get it confused between the man and what a husband is. Now, watch this. God provide for me a woman. I need a woman. And God says, you do need a wife. But God, I want a woman. She got to be a woman. But she might not be wife material. God provide for me a car. And God say, you won't even get faithful to riding your city bus. But I want a car. God provide for me a car. You won't go get your driver license. God provide for me a home. You won't put back money for a rainy day. God provide for me love. You won't share it. God provide for me wealth. I want to be rich. And God goes and says, I made you rich already. Look at all the, the stuff you accumulated. Look around you. You're rich in this area. Rich in that area. Abram didn't ask God for nothing. Notice when God came to him and told him, I'm the all, I am the almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. The very first thing Abram did was fail to his face. I remember when I heard the voice of the Lord the very first time in my life. I took off running. How many of y'all struck out when you heard God's voice? Huh? You just because it didn't sound like sensitivity. It didn't sound like he was sympathizing with me. He called my name strong. Derek, Derek. I said, uh oh, not now. I took off running. I was, I was running. I mean, I ran. Me and my marijuana I had. I had a I was rolling up a blunt. I was 19 years old. Going down the street. Putting it in and rolling it up. Right on Catherine Street, 3200 block. I remember it. Yeah, I do. I remember where I come from. 
Amen, somebody. Amen. Sitting there like Adam's in Wonderland. Y'all know some of y'all. God's still delivering y'all. I'm delivered from this stuff. Amen. But I'm going to talk about my testimony. <laughs> you look at me like, Pastor, you used to smoke? Before I was a pastor, I was smoking. Amen. Amen. <laughs> I ain't have no problem smoking. Sin felt good. <laughs> so I'm walking and I'm rolling. Next thing you know, I heard it. He called my name twice. Derek, Derek. I looked up. I said, not right now. Dropped that dope and took off. I had the cigar still in my hand. I dropped all that weed. I took off. I ran to my Uncle Eddie's house. He stayed right next door to me on Catherine. I was coming from the store off of Catherine, Alabama up there. And I'm talking about walking. Coming up from the store in Alabama, rather. And I turned on Catherine. I ran to my uncle house. I passed my house and ran straight to his house. I said, man, he said, what's wrong with you? I said, man, God just called me. He said, well, don't run over here. Go to your house. You stay right there. Because you coming over here, don't bring him over here. Because I got company. He said, and you got to go. I said, well, you ain't going to even talk to me for a minute. He said, just whatever God say, you listen and obey. I heard God tell me, remember the covenant. What covenant? I don't know nothing about a covenant. So, I went in my house, turned my TV on, T.D. Jakes was on. The real heavy, heavy T.D. Jakes. You know, when he had the hair. The pit bull T.D. Jakes, you know. And he was speaking on covenant. And then he spoke on being counseled by God. He was using was covenant. And when you don't keep the covenant, God will counsel you. And then he said God will counsel out everything that you try to do for yourself. He'll counsel it out, but that's his way of counseling with you. Oh, I didn't want to hear that. I got up and I went to a church. Right on Abbey Street in Allendale. I got up. I got myself ready. I went to that church on Abbey Street. Called my cousin and asked him if he wanted to roll with me. He said, yeah. We went to the church. The preacher looked at the top balcony. He was preaching. And he said, come here. Come here. And I did just what the typical young man would do. I turned. And I had my hand right here, but I turned. He said, no, don't, I'm not talking about your neighbor behind you. I'm talking about you. The one that's pointing into his chest. Yeah, you, come here. Come down here. The Lord got a word for you. Ooh, I'm repenting before I even got down there. I promise you, I was like, Lord, forgive me for all my sins. <laughs> Grandmama Jesse, please show your show up. Don't let this God of yours do me like this. I don't know what this man going to say to me. And I hope he don't say the wrong thing. My mind ain't right tight. If you say the wrong thing, I'm going to jail. And I know it. Because I was thugging. I didn't want to hear that. But I wanted to go and get feel forgiven. Like some people do. They show up seasonal. They show up seasonal. So they can feel forgiven by God. If I show up in church, Christmas and Mother Day and Easter Saints. They come, you know, on a resurrection Sunday that they believe. I ain't going to mess with that tonight. But... Because they want to be forgiven. Because they rise again and come. He stayed on the cross a little too long. So if he stayed on the cross that long, he ain't in a rush to come get you while you're in your wrong. Trying to give you some time to get it right. Do that make sense? All right. Back to the testimony. I'm repenting as I walk down the aisle. And there was some deacons with some curls on their head. They had the chair, and they had their hands on top of the chair. I was scared. He said, give me them cigarettes out your pocket. Give me that gun. What? <laughs> I did what the typical young man would do. I said, man, he faking on me. Now I'm looking around. I'm guilty. He said, give me them cigarettes out your pocket. And give me that gun. The Lord is calling you. I couldn't do nothing right there. 
My hands was sweating like one of these church members in him. Just sweating. Pores just wet. I went in my pocket and I got them cigarettes. But I didn't want to give him my gun. I had a 25 on me. I didn't want to give it to him. And he asked me again. He said, can you give me the gun? Give it to you when it's over. But I need to talk to you. God got a word for you. The covenant. And that's the third time I done heard that. And I, I broke down crying. Right there. My cousin, he was like, you go, man, you good, you good. That was the on side of me because he walked behind me. You good, you good, cousin. You good. How? This man done said this to me and I know that's God. I, I grew up in a house where the virtues of God was extolled. I grew up in a church where they told you to listen for his voice. And his voice would sound like many waters and they, they, they expressed that to us. That God would talk to you in a strong voice like thunder and lightning. And when he speak it make everything inside of you like shake. You know, and that man told me that, that preacher, I could not deny it. I cried right there. He said, God want to save you forever. But you got to be willing to let him in. You holding something against him. I was. I was holding what I went through as a kid. I was holding that against God because I was angry with him because I felt like he should have protected me out of all them years I had been going to church. Not knowing that he still provided. Because whatever go on in your life, whether it's physical abuse, mental abuse, emotional abuse, psychological abuse, whatever abuse go on in your life, God still provide ways for you to get out of it or he'll provide a way for you to come through it. Do you hear what I'm saying? So he provided, I just didn't that he did. I couldn't see it because I wasn't taught how to look at God from every aspect. I was taught that he was just one way and that's strict. He's just one way and that's straightforward. I never was taught that God be in a nightclub with you. He in the dope house with you. They didn't preach that to us. They they preach. That's the. Well, how can God send his spirit in a place and pull somebody out if God's scared to go in the devil's territory? Now, wait a minute. Because if Satan is not afraid to come before God, you better know God sure ain't scared to go before the devil. So the devil comes like with Job. He came walking to and fro. The Bible said in Job. In the first and second chapter, in the days that the sons of God came to present themselves, and Job came along also to present himself before the Lord and offer up the incense and all that and pray, you know, the Bible said that Satan came also. So God still what? Provided for Job. It took 42 chapters. We don't know how many years that it took. I can't say 42 chapters was 42 days. I can't tell you that. I can just only tell you that I'm quite sure it wasn't today and next week Job was out of it. We can preach it like that, but it didn't happen that soon. I don't believe that. Because I believe the Bible gave us close enough of an account of the events that was taking place so we can relate to them. So when we go through something, we might not have everything stripped from us like Job at one time. But we still have to go through, somebody say, process. We still got to go through the process of this thing in order for God to provide. It don't feel good to have a loss of nothing or a loss of anything. Nobody wants to lose nothing, especially when you lose it. But you end this of a loss just so you can get to your gain at the end. Come on, somebody. How would you know what the gain feel like if you never lost anything? It's almost who goes and never falls when they run in, but they always win in first. But that person's heart gets hurt when the person that they race it against fall, but get up and run even faster and beat the person who has never failed. 
Well, you don't know what that fall did for that person. You might have thought that fall stumbled and hurt them, but really the fall actually put intensity or a drive within them that said, get up and now go. Sometimes people have to fall in order to get back up. In the fall, God provided a way to get up. In the going forward, God provided a way for you to stay on the narrow path so you can stay straight. So watch this. Watch this. He told me some things about my life, what I was going to go through, and he told me exactly what was going to happen to me and how it was going to happen. And he told me I was getting ready to go to jail. Oh, I didn't want to receive that one. No, nobody. When he said that, I was angry. And, you know, I told him, I said, can I go my way, man? He said, you can go in peace. But the voice of the Lord just spoke to you. I went back to Bozier City. Over so and so house. I'm not calling that person name. But I went to a per particular person house. And I was accused of a crime I did not commit on my way coming from the Circle K. I went and bought me a 40 ounce St. Ives Slick Malt Liquor. I was going to get drunk and smoke me some more weed. And I was going to go back and crash at my house. Because I was trying to be cool, calm, and collective. But I saw something going on. Help out. Well, God created a situation for me to get to where I had to go and take me through the process. The process became I was accused of a manslaughter charge. And then on top of that, it was a cruelty to a juvenile charge. And I was like, now how I do two things at one time and I ain't did nothing wrong? On one occasion, I was accused on this. Now, I'm going to jail for this. But then another charge was thrown on me because the person who I was sinning with, and I'm just going to be honest, I was sinning with her. She was sinning with my cousin. Ain't that scandalous. That's just how life is. So, I ended up going to jail that night. Well, it didn't register on me. It didn't dawn on me that I was actually in jail during the process of being fingerprinted. That didn't dawn on me. My mama, my sister, and them, they're going to get me out. Didn't dawn on me. What done on me that I was locked was when I heard the door open the cell block D. And I heard it go Tum. close cell block boom. And that thing slammed my whoop. Whoa, the clinging sound. Have anybody ever been to jail other than me? It's magnetic, it's a force. And you ain't the hook. So you're not breaking. I'm trying to help y'all understand this. But I heard the sound. It shook something in me. And it done on me. You in jail. The word of the preacher came back to me. In my mind and I can see it. You're getting ready to go to jail, says the Lord. But in, even in jail, he told me, he said, God was going to use me. And I didn't want to hear that. And I asked, can I go my way? Watch what happened. I'm going to show you how we think when it's almost too late. But it's never too late with God. In my mind, I was thinking, why did I say, man, can I go my way? Why I just didn't stay and finish hearing him out? Maybe I never would have came to jail. Maybe he would have gave me a solution to get around going to jail. Eh, wrong. You was going to go to jail anyway because that was the word of the Lord for me. Because I had did something in another state and I, I hot tail it back here to Louisiana. And I, I know I prayed to do what I did and asked God, let me get away. But I told him, I said, whatever you want me to do, okay. When I get to the street pole, I do it. I didn't know what I was saying. 
Just going to stop right here and be honest with y'all. Be careful what you tell God. He do hold Man, I feel like it still, make, it still makes me well up sometimes when I think about it. I think about the, the, the foolishness that I did to get the place that I'm in when I say, Lord, I could have just watched somebody else mess up and learn. But no, I had to go through the process. You know why? Because when people walk in fresh from prison, they're not looking for a Joel Osteen. They're looking for somebody who's been right there through the gutter that the word of the Lord going to come to them that, hey, you might have been in prison, but you don't have to walk like you're still in prison. Come on, somebody. Amen. They don't need to know from, from somebody who's been, who been through men after men after men after men and look like they could not make a right decision, but God turned a bad situation and gave them a right choice. Amen. And they finally got it. And can say, you know, God provided. He, he made ways for me. He helped me to escape this. I escaped that. And I come through this. I come through that. I wouldn't have what I have if it wasn't for God. So we, we can't be a church who is too sanctimonious. And all we can say is God is going to the bad of our life. Why read the Bible and read they bad but too afraid to let somebody let you I mean, let them read you as a Bible. You know, they, now they got this. You might be the only Bible that somebody would read. Well, how would they know if you're a Bible if they never read the Bible? If they don't even know what a Bible is, how would they know you're the Bible? The only thing I can say is you will be the only light that they can see that can reflect Christ. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. So when we reflect what we, and we talk about what we've been through and what we have gone through, it shouldn't be a thing where we feel like we should hold our head down because of our past. No, your past, P-A-S-T, is the reason why you're still going because it's now become a P-A-S-T Why you P-A-S-S. You done went past the past. Do you see what I'm saying? Abraham could have stopped when he lost Ishmael and God told him to send him away with his mother. I like to call that sermon baby mama drama. It's in the book. Oh yes, amen. It's in the Bible. Concerning Ishmael. I don't want this kid nor his mama around me no more. That's basically what she said. She said because this boy keep mocking me. And I, he's not going to be an heir with my child. Now, wait, Sarah. You're not the first baby mama. You're the second one. You and your husband thought it would be wise to go what? A fulfillment of promise. Can I stop right there and tell us? God don't need our help fulfilling what he said. Somebody say, give me a scripture. My word will not return unto me void. But it's That's the Lord. Send it out to do. Amen. So if God tells you he cut a covenant with first. If first lady get a word from the Lord and he says to her, I got a covenant. You're going to bear a son. First lady need to get all the full detail from God. By who? Why? Because here go a story that these people did not get the full instructions from God. You're going to bear a son, did he not? God told Sarah, you and Abram are going to have a child. She looked at her age, looked at his age. She was like, God, please. <laughs> I'm stricken. I'm barren and I'm old. And you mean to tell me I'm pushing a, I'm giving birth to a baby in this old age? You should have caught me in my prime. But God said it. Amen. Now, if they didn't believe it, and they would start to play experiment, and now here handmaid Hagar. Here goes Sarah. Abram, go into my handmaid. 
She's really a slave girl. She's really a damsel. She cannot refuse to do what the master says. If she want to eat, she better do what she's told. But wait a minute. The way that the story goes, it seemed like they just went in and was happy ever after. No. Can I tell you that even during the time she conceived, she still had hormone raging. Abram had to go in and still perform. Y'all, it wasn't a one night stand. No, don't get it twisted. When she called for Abram, he had to go in. Sarah got to see the tent rocking. Hear the moaning and groaning. That's ready. That's PG-13. But wait a minute. Who in here want to be a wife that feel like because you can't have children, but you know your, you know your, your, your housekeeper can, so you're going to tell your husband, huh, baby, take the housekeeper. You don't have this baby for us. Uh, somebody say that. Read the story. Read it in his fullness and ask the Holy Ghost to bring you behind the scenes of their walk. And because of the fact that something took place for Isaac to get here, it was coming in the 90 some years. They was just, imp somebody say impatient. impatient. They was very impatient. They weren't willing to wait. Oh, I wish Juanita Bynum would have been singing, I don't mind waiting back then. Because they should have sung that, I don't mind waiting. But because Abram had to learn God through his suffering. Oh God, that's powerful. He didn't, he didn't, he didn't learn God through his success. He learned God through suffering. Amen. We don't learn. It's harder for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven than it is for a camel to go through the Isle of Neal. Abram learned God through suffering. We learn God through suffering. Watch what the scripture says to us about Jesus. If we suffer with him, we reign with him. Watch what Peter said to us. Peter said, let's arm ourselves likewise with the same mind. In other words, gird yourself up with the same mind. Suffering is just a part of his deliverance. Suffering is a part of God's way of life. You suffer no matter if you do good or you do bad. Can I tell you that to bad people and there are bad things that happen for good people? Can I tell you that? You could be driving down your down, down the highway. You haven't done nobody no harm. You just good. You don't bless people. You just left your mom's house. You cooked for her. You just left from over at your sister's house. You went over there and washed the clothes for her because she had a double shift to work. And she Good Samaritan. And all of a sudden, watch this. You ain't did no wrong. But you stop at a red light and somebody jump out of the out of the bushes with a gun to your head. Bust your window and say, give me your car. You ain't did nothing. You worked hard for your car. You can't go and go, God, why? Why? What did I do to deserve this? What didn't you do? part of, say this with me, the process. It's part of the process. Now that's a form of suffering. Cause you, so you lose your car, but you ain't lose your head. Amen. I think you should be shouting. Amen. You see how us believers have it twisted? We want to shout, tap the dance flow and we're praising, praising, praising the chicken flock, praise them and, and, and Cut the rug, praise him when he bless us. But when he mess with us, we don't want to praise him. Abram, 90 and 9 years old, sit up here and all of a sudden God said he's going to give him a seed. He's going to give it to him. He's going to bless him. You know? Okay. All right. This woman now messing with Sarah. She walking around showing. You know, the more a woman shows, you know she get to walking like this. Hand be moving like this. And I'm quite sure when she had to pick up. Uh-uh, don't, 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 don't do that. 
I, I, let me get. And Sarah sitting there like, hmm. You young. Hmm. Hmm. Soon as the child is born, Sarah wants the boy. But Sarah got to wake up to reality. It's not your baby. Come on, somebody. That's not your seed. Watch this. Here go the reality check. But obey his wife. Because God is not going to create a situation and let one suffer without everybody suffering. That's going to be a suffering on all parts. But God going to still work it out. Sarah says, send him away and send her away. Abram says, I can't do that. That's my son. God talks to Abram and says, obey your wife. You obey her in the act. Obey her again and do what she said since you did what she said. Now do it again and send them away. Wow. No, God told him to obey your wife and she said, send them away. Wait a minute. What you mean? What about all your kids in life? Some are some Ishmaels. What? You take care of them? Yeah. You provide through the grace and mercy of God. Don't trip on the man. Watch this. This going to help somebody. Might not be for you, but this for somebody right here. A five mama. Five different baby dads. But you mad at the one that's working, trying to have some, so you go put him on child support because he won't support the other folks. I don't think you caught. I don't think they caught that. Can I say it again? A five time around baby mama, five different baby dads. But you mad at the one that's working and trying to go somewhere and get somewhere. Now you gonna put him on the child support because he refused to give your other foe some support. Why? Cause that fifth one he is, but the mother foe ain't. Because he started with them. He's not obligated. But the other four baby daddies, you let them come through every now and again. Drop off a present. But the kids don't get the gift. Boy, y'all ain't going to talk to me. Y'all know it's real. It's real like that. You get lace front. You get suited up. You get fulfilled. But... You don't get no enjoyment and no gratification out of it, well, satisfaction rather, out of it. Because when reality checks you, when you get checked with reality, and reality says this, you didn't accomplish anything because that person just came and used you. Now you're looking for an increase out of the one that's working. You want to script him. It can be vice versa. You got some men that put women on child support and they want to strip them. Strip them for everything they got. Because they get custody of the kids and they go and play, I'm the dad, I'm the, I'm the guardian, I'm the legal guardian, I'm the custodian parent and, and, and all that other stuff. And Okay, alright, where you going homeboy with all that? Where you going? Where you going? You know, and, and they take advantage. Every time you get the Vice versa. Women do the same. And what I'm saying to you is this. You can't afford the trip because the process is. You have to endure the process, go through the process, but look to come out of the process. Somebody say that with me. Endure the process. Go through the process, but come through the process. Don't, don't, don't try to endure while you in it. You endure before you even get there. That means you got to get your mind right. You got to gird up your mind. You got to be renewed by the transforming of your mind. Transform your mind. Don't try to transform your pocketbook. Don't transform your house. Don't try, because I don't understand it. It's just a culture thing sometimes, I believe. We as a group of black people, we get hurt the first thing we do, 
we gonna get our hair back like we ain't hurt no more. We gonna put on new clothes. We gonna get a, a car note. Trying to show the next person you ain't brought me down. Be honest with yourself. It hurt. Stay in your house and eat your eyes if you have. Don't go through it. And when you get ready to step, don't step out just because you want to show somebody. Step out because you want to show people that you know somebody. Amen. The person that brought you through it. Amen. Every person need to give themselves time to recover and heal from broken things. Amen. Man, I wish I would have had this type of teaching in my life when I was coming up. Abram goes and, let me get back. Close out on Abram. But as I went to, when I went into prison, I got on my knees that night. I met a Caucasian guy by the name of Scott. And Scott gave me a blue Bible. He told me, here you go, Sally. I didn't know what Sally was. So in my mind, I'm thinking he's going to try me. So I better get ready to fight. He said, blue guy, you got to go up top. I ain't say nothing. He said, hey, we praying tonight at 7. You want to pray? I said something then. I said, yeah, I, I pray. He said, no, you don't have to pray. We just going to be in the circle and praying. Huh? He said, yeah, we're going to get in the circle. I said, what are you in here? He said, no, watch. He said, at 9 o'clock, they're going to open up the doors for us because they always let us do that. And that's what we have here. We have a brotherhood here. Well, we get in the circle right there where the guards can see. And we pray. He say, uh, normally, truck driver pray. That's what a guy named truck driver they call because he was a guy that drove 18 wheelers. Truck driver, I met him that night. And he looked me in my face. He said, you need this life application study Bible. I said, for what? Because you got a veil over you. He said, the veil is over you. But I can see through it. What? You you don't mess me up. He said, that's why you need the life application study Bible. So you can read and study. He said, man, you know you got a call on your life. He looked at me and said, this is just part of the process. That broke me. You know what I did? I did what church folk do. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord Jesus. I went down on my knees and I just started crying. I did. They prayed for me. They prayed for all of us. And they let us back in our house. We climb at the top bunk and it's like the Holy Spirit pulled me back down. It was like, that was them. But now this is me and you. I got on my knees and I said, I remember like yesterday. I said, the God of my grandmother, if you really real, please show me. I'm scared. I've never been locked up this long. I don't know how long I'm going to be in here, but I'm scared. I'm scared for my life. I don't know what they're going to do to me in him. Help me. But first, I felt his presence. It felt warm and a little cold at the same. It was like a, a, a room temperature change. Like if somebody turned the, 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 the AC off and it was hot, cold. And this is exactly what he said. He said, you don't have to worry. I got you. Well, that spirit didn't sound right. And I shook it up. I'm telling you the truth. I said, that's not, that's not, that's not what my grandmama said. He talked like, that's not his voice. And when I shrugged my shoulder off, I felt that presence leave. And I, I just sat there, folded on my knees, and I just cried tears. 
hot tears. And when I tell you, it's like he put his hands around me, but inside me. Took his hands and wrapped me up around my stomach and balled me tight. Fear not. I will be with you. It is I. Stand up, son of man. Stand up. That's what he told me. And in my gospel song that I did, you thought I was through, you thought I was gone. That song still standing strong. You hear me say the words, and he spoke to me and said, son of man, stand on your feet. I was talking about my life. That was the words he told me. Son of man, he called me son of man. And he told me, eat the word. Eat it. Just he said, open thy mouth. And it's like he spit something in there. And that night I went to sleep, I slept like I was in heaven. The morning they called us to get up, to check the box. I met a guy named Kelvin. Kelvin sang like an angel. He was in there for corner knowledge to a juvenile because he turned 18 and the female that he was dating, she still was 17. But he being black and she being the parents had a problem with that. So they was waiting on him to go and turn 18 so they can call him laws. And then he had impressed her and she was 17. Well, 16. And she turned 17 when she had the baby. But he turned 18 and that's when they called laws. So he not only went to jail for corner knowledge to a juvenile, they were trying to get him for statutory rape. Long story short, he had a beautiful voice and he sang that song, I'm still holding on to his hands. That song when he said, they say I wouldn't make it, they say I wouldn't be here today. Woo, when he sung, I'm talking about the whole prisons was quiet. From the city all the way over to parish until to penitentiary. I moved four different times. Going into penitentiary, penitentiary is not jail. That's the real deal. You're on maximum lockdown. That's where you're among killers and real rapers. So I'm getting ready to do my years. Getting ready to do 10 because that's what they told me. Cop out and do 8. Well, when I went before the judge, he asked me how long I had been in there. I told him. And he slammed the hammer down and told me eight years. My heart dropped. But that same point, I heard the voice of God. Let me, I'm going too ahead of myself, so let me back up. Before I went to court, God started using me as I was learning. A driver would ask me to do the wrong. The Holy Ghost would speak and say, don't say prayer call, prayer call. Stand there, they know. So I just went up there and stood. The guys got out their bunk, they say, look, preacher boy finna pray today, y'all. That preacher boy over there. Preacher boy. And as they came around, they was looking for me to pray. I, I was like my wife. I didn't know what to pray. But because what was in me knew what to pray. The Holy Ghost would tell me, let this person know they're getting ready to go home in the morning when they go to court. Right while prayer was going on, I would touch it. God said, you get ready to go home in the morning when court comes. Just keep the faith. And still be praying. One dude came to my bunk and he said, you told me God say, I'm going home. I don't have no court date. I said, just, God said, I know I heard him. Woo, he got that call at that 5 o'clock morning. They call everybody's name for court. Let you know what time to be ready. His name was right there at the last at the bottom. His name got called. He looked at me. Truck driver looked. He said, the process has begun. I didn't feel good about it. I was scared. Because I didn't know what to expect. No, 
God will use me to say things to people that will help them to be encouraged. I met a guy that was down there. He was a homosexual. His name was James. I'm not going to tell you his last name so you won't go trying to find him. But they called him Shaky. And when I got to the penitentiary, he told me his name was Shaky, but they called him Melissa. So I said, well, what's your real name? He said, my name James. I said, well, I'm going to call you James. I said, and you're going to become the Lord's brother. That's what you're going to become, the Lord's brother. I said, God going to use you. He said, you don't know nothing about me. I got ready to use the restroom. He was trying to look at me. I said, hey, mind your business somewhere else now. I said, I'm still a man. You ain't going to violate me. Somebody wanted him to be involved in something that was unrighteous. Somebody wanted him to do an act that wasn't godly. And I didn't know that the boldness of the Holy Ghost was going to stand up. I was in my bottom bunk, reading my Bible, minding my business. And it was, the lights went off, poop, TV went off, poop. And they were like, come on, you know what's going on? Come on. Dude walking and he, he was just walking with him. Going over there where the bathroom showers was. And the Holy Ghost in me said, not tonight. Just like that. I ain't want to say that. I was minding my business, reading my Bible. I was reading the book of Proverbs. Trying to learn some wisdom between a foolish man and a wise man. Came out, not tonight. And both of them look. And he said, this ain't got nothing to do with you. You mind your own business over there, preacher. You know I'm a preacher. Not knowing that the word travel faster in jail than it do on the streets. It tripped me out because my daddy leaving, but I'm coming. My daddy coming out, and I'm going in. Boy, I tell you, it's something. He had got the word that your son coming down him. He got the word that I had been bounced around and they called me sleepy and preacher. And that's all I do is sleep and read the Bible and pray. He knew more about me where he was at. I didn't get a chance to see him. He didn't get a chance. Thank God we never got a chance to run across each other. He probably would have got me in some trouble. I'd have had to fight. Because he'd have been like that. Come on. Then there you go. From. <laughs> so, when it came out and it was said, it eventually, the dude got an attitude about it. But the guy, James, didn't have a problem. James sat on my bunk at the foot and told me, thank you. I told him, man, get away from me. Let somebody think that I deal with you like that. He said, no, you came to, to protect me. I said, I said, no, I do. Because I still had a little cockiness in me and arrogance. I said, no, I ain't come to protect you. And whatever, I, I ain't trying to get into no trouble. I said, and I ain't to protect him. When I said Folks are looking like, so you're not the one that God sent? It blew me for, it blew my mind because of what was being said. What was saying? I was still trying to learn this thing and trying to make sense of it. Don't you know it's hard to make sense of something and help somebody else while you're confused about what it is? You know, I, I'm not attacking anybody, but some people cannot Make sense of their own stuff. Amen. Make sense of what you're going through before you try to deliver somebody from what they're going through. Amen. Get your stuff under control and open doors for you so we can go home. Is that 
I end up helping him and helping other guys. A, a, a dorm that was called Thunder Dorm. Man, it was known for violence and fighting. Three months in to that penitentiary, it got quiet. The guards wanted me to go over to the other dorm and see, can I help them? I told them, don't send me over there. I don't know them people. I start going to the to the library outside on wreck and play basketball sitting in their pants and they pocket and stuff and put it down in the other world to dry it out to smoke it because they smoke anything. One dude asked me, man, let me see the white pages that's empty in your Bible. I said, but wait, I'm going to smoke the word. I said, not my word you won't be smoking. I learned a lot of stuff in jail about Zuzus, Wham Whams, and everything else. I learned how to make uh, burritos out of salmon sausages and hot chips with noodles. Just everything. Snicker balls and milk and make wine out of juice with bread. Make tattoo ink out of soot and water bottles and magazine ink off the paper. Jesus, you learn a lot. You learn how to start fire with with a battery and a razor blade with a headphone wire. <laughs> you can just jump it out and cotton. You learn everything in jail. It's nothing new. You can even get a cell phone. <laughs> Holy Ghost, help me. <laughs> but I learned so much. But the Lord told me, he said, don't go outside and play ball. Don't go to the courtyard and work out. And all that bodily exercise profit you little. He said, go learn the law. Go learn the law. Now, that's the Apostle Paul type of word. Paul knew the law. God, well, I, I was learning God's law, the law of righteousness and the law of the book. But I didn't know our laws, the constitutional our amendments. I didn't know anything about it. So watch this. God knew that all of this was part of the process. Why? Because one day you're going to have to teach people. When they come to you trying to kick that constitutional, I'm on my brother's keeper type of talk. You can know what the constitution say, but you better know what the contribution is to us. It's a gift given to us. Long story short, I'm to the coast. I know. The process I got to go through. So here I am. Okay. You said you were going to be with me. I'll take you back all the way to the city. When I got first locked up, Jesus, he was with me. He was with me. One night, the Lord spoke to me. He said, make disciples because you're getting ready to go home. And the Lord said, that same night, he said, at the table tonight, take up an offering. Now, how are we going to take up an offering? He said, Everything that y'all accumulated from making store that go for rolling our noodles, for zuzus and well wings, that go for the juice that you didn't drink that morning but you hid it, all that, he said, bring it to the table as a tent and give to the less fortunate in jail. There was a man that was in the wheelchair that had his leg cut off. He had his leg amputated, so in his wheelchair. And nighttime came, the wheelchair out. So he can rest in the in the in the in the room and be in his bunk. That night, I remember they made, they had me to do, I did the prayer, I did the Bible studying that night. But the wreck man, whatever they call him, he wrote my name on the on the wall over on the uh on the paper over there that it was my night to my I didn't have a problem with that. He did that to be spiteful because he took the other guy's name off and put me there. Well, they trashed the flow. The enemy rose up that night. They trashed it. I was cleaning it up. Dude was like, say cuz you forgot some. Over there with all that preaching, you be preaching. See, you're going to live like that when you get out. Yeah, that's that jailhouse talk, that religion. I ain't say nothing. 
Dude told one dude, you going to getting up out of here? I'm going to knock you out. Ooh. Start thinking in my head. Lord, why they want to fight me? What did I do? You don't have to do anything. Just the idea that God done already told them because when he spoke it to you, everybody heard it. You shared it. I played a Joseph right there. I told my dream too soon. I told the vision too soon. Now the enemy raising up. Got the court that morning. I didn't get seen. One o'clock came around. They called us to come back in. They put us in a holding cell. Told us to come on back for the second part. After recess, judge took a break. Told my sister, they was there. And it's the judge telling me that because I had already been locked up almost six good months. No, a year and six months. I'm sorry, a year and six months already. They said, the judge, they witnessed the judge saying, two years parole if you do good. I had a total of 10 years and told me that I'm going to do eight flat and get out on two years paper if I do good. It seems like he's trying to start my senses back over. Because they had papers on me and the DA was trying to get evidence on me and nobody had nothing on me. That sounds like God. The lady who they thought was going to testify against me, she eventually died. She was already old. So that testimony went out the window. The other young lady who was trying to testify against me, she eventually moved around and they couldn't locate her. So that testimony failed. God can work in your favor if you be faithful. Amen. Even though I didn't know why I was there, God knew. But when I caught the, the knowledge of the reason why I came into there, because it was a then God and I both knew what it was that God knew so I could all walk through this process now. It wasn't easy now. Don't let me just sit here and tell you that being locked up, I ain't have no long days. I had some long days and some longer nights. And when the, that time changed, it was short days for y'all out here, but long days. And it was short nights for y'all, but long nights. Plenty of time I cried. Plenty of time. Oh, uh, ladders saying, y'all got to tell my sister her rich self put her house up. If not, I'm going to hang myself. I can't do 10 years. I can't cop out like that. I ain't did nothing. Nobody in the family responds to me. Nobody talks to me. Everybody saying, Derek, no, he did. He now we're going to confess because he, he, lived, he lived on the edge anyway. He know he did that and did this. And everybody was against me. But God was for me. Yeah, I'm going to tell the truth. I ain't getting no family mails. I wrote a letter and I still got this letter right today. My wife will tell you and she's surprised that I still kept them letter. I wrote a letter to myself. And I said that that letter should meet me at the house when I get home. That letter met me at home. I had all the prisoner names that I came in contact with. To be in saints. 36 men. God saved them. I ran across 16 of them out here. Out of the 36. And probably 8 of them was still saved. But back to prison. Or back in that. Back on drugs. Got out of that same day. Called my uncle. Told Minister Lonnie Bolden. I said. Hey, uncle. He said, who is it? I said, it's Derek. Derek, how you calling me from jail? And I got jail. Came and got me out my cell. And ate something night, man. Told me I can go home. Where you at? I'm, I'm dying in penitentiary, man, in Mendon. Where you think I'm at? He said, what? He said, no. You done broke out. Where you at? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call them people for you. Years. I heard that judge. Nephew, don't do it. They're going to kill you if they catch you. Where you at? 
I said, oh, please come get me before 12 o'clock. Because they told me at 12 o'clock they're going to let me out right there in plain dealing. And I'm going to have to walk the rest. I don't know my way. My way. Me and the Black Knight. That's the car he had. The stand shift. Five years, but he drove it like he had 20 years. He came and got me. It was 11.53. Woo! The guard looked at me. The white guard did. The Caucasian guard. I call him the big show, but he would be. He looked at me and he said, 100%, I give you 99. You'll be right back. I said, you. That's what I told him to preach the gospel. The Puerto Rican little man, Officer Rico, he Puerto Rican guy. me he say and he talked jewel 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 like that you're a special person you are gonna be used mightily I believe in God but I got you got you 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 got a better chance than me and, and he shook my hand gave me a hug and they don't do this but they let me outside to breathe and right there outside I heard the devil from a distance Saying, I've been waiting on you. Got out, did some wrong, made some mistake. God scraped me up. Fell back again. God picked me back up. Messed up. God turned me back right. Put me back straight. Messed up. God kept. What are you saying? You sound like you. No, I'm saying that his mercy never ran out upon my life. Same way his mercy didn't run out on mine. And I finally done came to a point where I said, okay, Lord. Much as possible, no more messing up. That that I know to do that's right, I'm gonna do that's right. That that I don't know that's wrong. If I don't, nobody else got to run up in my face and tell me you living wrong. Now God, you correct me and let me get it right. You see what I'm saying? Abram, I'm closing with this. That's the sixth time I've said that. Abram offered up Isaac, but God gave a ram. Abraham did not learn a full valuable lesson. Only thing he knew that God will provide. Why did not why Abraham did not learn? Because of the fact that Abraham still had problems after that. He had problems with Sarah. He had so much problems that when Sarah died, he married another woman. Now Sarah was that good to you, you should have remarried. But they said it's not good to what? Remarried in. The devil is a liar. You better marry until you marry the right one. If you don't marry the right one, you better divorce and, and, and pray God send me the right one, but help you the whole night. And say God see you the right one and help you to hold out when you got to go through the process of being single until the right one come. You will know when the right one is there. Abraham was a good man, but Abraham had some bad things. But Sarah had some hangups in her life. Hagar being a good, faithful servant, but she had some hurt. She had to walk with in life. She had to walk. Man, I'm trying to go home, Jesus. She had to walk with that pain. Why? Because you gave me a bottle of water and a loaf of bread. Somebody say communion. communion. He gave her communion. He gave her some fellowship. Water represents spirit. It's funny. I was crying by the wall. But God looked and spoke through the angel and said, I cry of the land. Ishmael ain't crying. He ain't crying. But God heard Ishmael. And then he told Hagar, dry your tears. Go over to the weeping wall. Get some water. There go your water. You, you get water from a wall that's crying. You better know that wasn't no sweet water. It almost shot. Water. You can drink 
the bitterness of life. But guess what? It'll be sweet when it come through. It can go down bitter, but when it get ready to come up, it's sweet. Don't let what you go through make you bitter. Reverse it. Let it be sweet when you come through it. You might go through something and you feel bitter. When you get delivered, you should feel better. Amen. Come on, somebody. Amen. Come on, give God a hand. Amen. I ain't got too much to cover, so I'm through. I'm through. I better be through. Amen. I'm through. Amen. God bless us.